Well, I'm very happy to have back on the show Joshua Fletcher, a dear friend of mine and quite a rock star. He has written a new book called And How Does That Make You Feel? Everything You Never Wanted to Know About Therapy. Welcome back, Josh. Oh, it's good to be back. Thanks, Kim. And when was the last time we spoke together on a podcast? I think you were on a the disordered podcast not so long ago that was uh that was lovely but That's yeah right. i remember my my uh guest appearance on your anxiety toolkit it was lovely i know i'm so happy to actually spend some time chatting with you together i'm very excited about your new book it's all about therapy and anxiety and how, what it's like to be a therapist and the process of therapy and all the things. How did this book come up about? So I wanted to write a book about people who struggle with anxiety, but in the mainstream, because a lot of the literature out there is very self-help and it's in a certain niche. One of my biggest passions is to write something engaging with a nice plot where people are reading about something or a storyline that they're interested in. Uh, whilst inadvertently learning, learning without realizing you're learning. That's my kind of entertainment when I watch a show and I've learned a lot about something or when I've read a book and I've inadvertently learned loads of things because I'm taking in the plot. With this book, I wanted to write a book about therapy. Now, that initially might not get people to pick it up, might not interest you, might not interest you what about anxiety therapy, but I wanted to write something that anyone could pick up and enjoy and learn lots because I want to share our world that we work in with the, the general public. And so the, the hook that I focused on here was, have you ever wanted to know what your therapist is thinking? And I thought, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to tell people what I'm thinking and I'm yeah. going to invite people behind the, the therapy door and you're going to see what I do and what's going on in my head as I'm trying to work with people who struggle with mental health. And yeah, I wrote the pitch for it. People went bananas and they loved it um, because it's not been done before. Not necessarily a good thing if it's not been done before. And yeah, and here we are. Um, I, I love it. I'm really proud of it. And I want people to laugh, cry, be informed, feel, go on a journey, learn more about therapy, learn more about anxiety, and yeah, all in one book. Yeah. I think that the cool, one of the cool, one of the many cool things about it is as a therapist, I'm always, people seem to be always very curious or intrigued about therapists, about what it's like and what, you know, what it's like to be in a room with someone who's really struggling or when you're, you're handling really difficult topics and how to be just a normal human being and a therapist at the same time. Yeah, I, th I think what I want to write about is to remind people that therapists are human. We have our vices and flaws. I'm not talking on behalf of you, Kim. I'm sure you're perfect. Not. No, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> flawed as uh, flawed could be. Yeah, but to a level that it's like even my like our brains have different voices in them all the time, different mm -hmm. thought processes as part of our rationalization. And I wanted people to peer inside that and, and, and have a look. So one of them is like the book opens with me and a client and it's going really well. And this person's talking, this character's talking about where they're up to and celebrating on the brink of something great. And then there's the voice of biology that just pops into the room, into my head. And it's the biology of you need to go to the toilet. Why did <laughs> And then the voice of critic comes in and says, why did you drink an Americano moments before this client? Now you're sat here and you can't, you can leave if you want, but it would be distasteful and you're on this brink of this breakthrough. And so I've got this argument going on in my head going, you need the toilet. Yeah, but this person's on the brink of a breakthrough. And then I've got empathy like, yeah, but they feel so vulnerable. They want to share this. And then you've got analytical and all the chaotic conversations that are happening as a therapist, as I'm sat there, nodding and really wanting the best for my client. 
Exactly. Exactly. That's why I thought it was so brilliant. So for those of you who haven't read it, I encourage you to, but Josh really outlines at the beginning of the book, like all of these different voices that therapists and all humans have, like there's the, the anxieties voice and there's biology, which you said, like, I need to go to the restroom or there's the critic that's judging you, or there's the analytical piece, which is the, that clinical piece that's making sense of you know, the client and what's going on and the relationship and all the things. And I really resonated with that because um, I think that we think as clinicians, as we get better and more seasoned, that we only show up with this professional voice. We're on the whole time, but we're so not. Like we're so not on the whole time. Like this whole chatter is happening in the background. And I think you did a beautiful job of just normalizing that. Oh, uh, thanks, Kim. I it's it's a book that like therapists will like, but I, do you know what? Is people will identify their own voices in this, particularly the anxiety. You know, you and I talk about anxiety all day, every day. Um, always beginning with "what if" that voice of worry that sits around a big table of thoughts and tries to shout the loudest and often gets our attention uh, and. I try to show that this happens to a lot of people as well. It's just the what if is different. You know, so it's for, for some people, it's what if this intrusive thought is true? For, for some people, it's what if I have a panic attack? For some people, it's what if this catastrophe I've been ruminating on for so long happens? And for therapists, it's what if the, the worst thing that happens here, even in the therapy room? Um, I'm an anxiety therapist that has been through anxiety and I still get anxiety because I'm human. Uh, so I celebrate these voices as well. Also, because I'm human, I can be critical almost always of myself in the book. So I'm not just criticizing people I'm working with. Absolutely not. But that voice comes in and it's about balancing it and showing the work and a lot of what a lot of training to be a therapist is. It's about choosing the voice. And I didn't realize how much training to be a therapist actually helps me live day to day. Like, yeah. actually, I, I'm more um, rational when making more life decisions because I can choose to observe each voice, which was integral to me overcoming an anxiety disorder, as well as just facing life's challenges every day. Right. Right. Tell me, because we're really today talking a lot about like what it's actually like to be a therapist, and I, I emphasize the word actually, what is it actually like to be a therapist? Like if we were to be really honest. Uh, one thing I mentioned is that I talk about the therapeutic hour, which is how long, Kimberly? <laughs> 50 minutes. <laughs> yeah, the therapeutic hour. And I explain what we do in the 10 minutes that we have between clients on a busy day and people imagine us doing meditation or grounding ourselves or reflecting or whatever and sometimes I do do that sometimes I just scroll reddit look at memes <laughs> eat candy and do nothing uh and it's different each time that's yeah. what I'm doing I'm not yeah some my mystic sage in my office you know sitting s sinisterly under the lamplight waiting for you to come in no I'm usually faffing around panicking, checking that I don't look like a scruff, putting a brush through my hair, trying to hide the stains of food I've got on my shirt because I overzealously consume my lunch. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, and there's obviously some funny stories in there, but also there's dark stuff in there as well. Like when I trained to be a therapist, I went through grief and it, it really, I made some quite unethical decisions back when I was training and, you know, not the ones I'm proud of, but actually shows the serious side of mental health and that a lot of therapists become therapists because of their yeah. own journeys. Uh, and I know that that applies to a lot of therapists I know. For sure. I I have to tell a, a story. A few months ago, um, I'm a member of lots of these therapist Facebook groups. And one of the therapists asked a question and said, you know, tell me a little bit what your um, like 
hour looks like before you see a client? Like what's your routine or, you know, your your procedure pre-clients? And all these people were saying like, I journal and I meditate and and all of these things. Some people were like, you know, I just, you know, I water the plants and I get my laptop open. And I just posted a meme of someone who's like, pushing all the crap off my table and like screeching into the computer screen and being like sitting up straight. And all of these people responded like, thank God, because all the therapists were like beautifully saying, and I just came in here honestly, like sometimes I literally sit down, open the laptop and I have, you know, it is a mess. And I'm just like, but I can in that moment be like, take a breath and be like, tell me how you're doing. Like you said, like how, how does that, and we start the, the therapeutic hour. And I think that we have to sort of normalize therapists being that kind of person. Definitely. definitely. I, I, th- I think one of the barriers to people seeking therapy is that power dynamic, that age old trope that someone stood leaning against a mahogany bookcase. Yes. Um, You've probably got a mahogany bookcase. You, your no. <laughs> practice is really nice. I certainly have. I've got an IKEA Kallax unit full of books I've never read. Exactly. But yeah, yeah. Your, so your I, books aren't <laughs> organized by color because mine are not. No, 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 no. There's just, there's just some filler books in there. You know, like just like, oh, why is They're Catcher fake. in the Rye? Why is Catcher in the Rye? I don't know. Just, just put it on there. I just want to look clever. And uh, But anyway, yeah, it's like, People are afraid of that power, power dynamic of some authority figure going in there about to judge them, mind read them, shame them, or, or an, analyze them. Um, yeah. And no, I think dispelling that myth by showing how human we are can challenge that power dynamic. It certainly did for me. I would much rather open up to someone who isn't showing the pretense that they have all of life together. Don't get me wrong. Professionalism is essential yeah but someone who's professional and human because going to therapy is some of the most human experiences you'll ever do i don't want someone who isn't showing too scared to show that sign Mm -hmm. or certain elements of 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 being human but obviously professionally and it's it's a fine balance to get um but when you do find a therapist like that for me personally one who's knowledgeable compassionate empathetic has humility I think beautiful things can happen. Yeah. I, I think you you use the word that I exactly was thinking of, which is it, it's such a balancing act to, as a therapist, honor your own humanity from a place of compassion. Like, yeah, we're not going to have it all together and it's not going to be perfect and we won't say the right thing all the time. But at the same time, be thoughtful and and have the skills and the supervision to balance it so that you are showing up really professional and um, from that clinical perspective. Tell me a little bit about um, consultation as, as a clinician. I know for me, I require a lot of consultation for cases, not because I don't know what I'm doing, but I really like for, I'm always going to be uh, honest with the fact that I maybe I'm seeing it from a perspective that I hadn't thought of yet. What are your thoughts on that kind of topic? Yeah. I mean, therapy's got to work for both people as well, Mm. because the therapeutic connection for, I believe is one of the drivers that promotes therapeutic growth and change uh it promotes trust and yeah i will consult with 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 clients and my supervisor and make sure it's right i'm not everyone's cup of tea but for people particularly with anxiety disorders they i think they they like to know and come to therapy i think i've used self-disclosure on my public platforms tastefully in the sense that I know what it's like to have gone through an anxiety disorder, whether it's OCD or panic disorder or agoraphobia, uh, and come out the other side. But also it's balancing that with actually, I'm your therapist here. I'm not going to, I will help you in a therapeutic setting and use my training. You know, Um, you know, I'm not someone who's got everything worked out, but you do know that someone that you know, that can relate 
that can step into your frame of reference. Something I talk about a lot in the book is frame of reference and, and empathy. If you feel like your therapist has done that and is in your frame of reference and is like, ah, oh, yeah, they, they kind of get it, or they're at least trying. Um, and we as therapists feel like there's a connection there too uh, on a professional and therapeutic level. I think magic can happen. And I love therapy for that. Uh, not all therapy is great and beautiful and wonderful. Some of it's messy and and some of it just doesn't work sometimes. And I do talk about that too. But it's about when you get that kind of intricate dance and match between therapist and client, I think, yeah, it's, it's life-changing. Yeah. What do you think about the type of person, the type of person you would have to be to be an anxiety specialist, especially if you're doing exposure and response prevention. The reason I ask that is um, I have a private practice in California. Um, I have eight clinicians that work for me. Almost every time I have a position that's open and when I'm interviewing people to come on to my team, um, I would say 60% come in and and they're good to go. They're like, I want to do this. I love the idea of exposure therapy. But there is often 40% who say, I'm not cut out for this work. This is not how I was trained. It's not how I think about things. Um, after I've explained to them what we do and the success rate and the science behind it, they they clearly say, this isn't for me. What are your thoughts about what it takes or what kind of person it takes to be an anxiety specialist oh that's that's a that's a great question um you, you gotta first of all you gotta trust and believe in the modality that you're trained in um you and i use the principles a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure response prevention um i've got first-hand experience of that you gotta trust the the science and what we know about human biology which is really important. Um, I, it's about what you're trained in, in that modality. What I talk about again, see how I'm segueing it back to the book. Brilliant. I've done my media training, Kim. <laughs> Always be, go back to the book. Come on, Josh. <laughs> what, one of my favorite chapters in the book is called, is explaining about modalities because a lot of people yeah. just think therapy is one big world where you see a therapist, they wave a magic wand, you feel better, and suddenly our parents love us again. No, that's not how it works. It's not? Mental health, no, it's not. <laughs> and, uh, th mental health has different presentations, and a modality is a school of thought that approaches difficulties in mental health. So the first modality I go to is person-centered, which is counseling skills, listening, empathy, unconditional positive regard. You know, the Carl Rogers way of thinking, I think, you know, I love that. Is that good for OCD, intrusive thoughts, exposure therapy, and phobias? Not really. It's nice to have a base of that because it's there's more chance of a of a therapist being like, you know, understanding, stepping your frame of reference and supporting you through that modality. But I wouldn't say it's equipped for that. Whereas in CBT, it's a lot of it's psychoeducation, which I love. And that's a different modality. Cognitive behavioral uh, sciences whether it's third wave, when you're looking at acceptance commitment, where you're looking at exposure response prevention. Uh, there's lots of song and dance about ICBT at the moment uh, and, and, and things like that. They're all different modalities of schools of thought. Then you've got psychodynamic, which is the mahogany bookcase, lie on the sofa, let's play word association. Oh yeah, you want to sleep with your mom, Josh? No, I don't. That's nothing to do with why I keep having panic attacks in the supermarket. Stop judging me. But that's a different type of uh, approach. Uh, Jungian approaches can be quite insightful, but it's got to match what the presentation is for you. Um, I think CBT is it's my favorite, but it sucks for stuff like grief. Yeah. I, when I was grieving, I did not want CBT. I did not want my grief formulated. I did not want to so, see that my behaviors were perpetuating discomfort. So I was like, yeah, that's just part of my grieving process. And in this chapter, I just talk about the different modalities. Therapists are very passionate about the modality of the school that they train in, because you have to give 
part of yourself to it. You have to go through it yourself. And I'm very passionate about the modalities I'm trained in. Uh, and so I play on this in the book by, it's called, there's a chapter called The Younger Games or The Younger Games, uh, <laughs> a play, play on words. And basically, it's uh, once a year, therapists from every modality, whether it's hypnotherapy, transactional analysis, CBT, person-centered, tr the trauma-informed, all of these, they all meet up in a field and we all fight to the death and the last remaining person is crowned the one true modality. Now, last year it was hypnotherapy. And what I also say that a betting tip for next year is the trauma informed. Mm -hmm. So every year I'll keep you updated on the younger games. Uh, and basically it's a narrative device to explain that within the world of therapy, there are different types of therapists. Yeah. You and I, we love CBT. We'll bang, we'll bang the drum for that. We feel that there's not enough ERP out there. That certainly isn't particularly with the evidence and the, that points towards it, mountains of evidence, but you know, other therapists may feel, not feel the same. So when yeah. people come to work at CBT school and they realize that, you know, Dumbledore, AKA Kim Quinlan is like, <laughs> no, we, we do ERP and we got to get down and dirty and do the horrible work. They're like, mm, that's, that's not as, that's not conducive to the, say the softer, uh, step back approach that I've trained in, in my modality. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always so happy that they just are honest with me, right? I remember as an intern at uh, OCD Center in Los Angeles, it, it very clearly saying like, are you okay talking about really very sexual, very, very graphic topics? Uh, you know, being very much like he listed off, like, here is what you're going to need to be able to talk about very clearly with a very straight face. You know, you're not, you can't have like a, a wincing look on your face when you talk about intrusive, violent, sexual thoughts. You, you're going to have to be up for the game. And I think that was a big thing for me. But what I think is really cool about your book, Nissi, now I'm bringing it back to your book, is it doesn't mean... <laughs> The voice isn't in your head sometimes questioning you, right? The one thing I, I, um, as I was reading it, I'm like, there is an imposter in therapists all the time saying that, like you said, the critic that's like, you don't know what you're doing. You're a fa failure. You're a flake. Like you're a complete fraud. You haven't got it together. You know, maybe you haven't even worked on the thing yourself yet. That that's going to be there. Yeah. And we still get, I still get that. I can't speak for you, but I think what makes a good therapist is a therapist who self doubts. You don't mm. want to go and see a therapist who thinks that they've got it all worked out. How uh, that's a red flag in itself. Yeah. A good therapist is one that always wants to, to improve and uses that doubt and anxiety to make themselves a better therapist. Don't get me wrong, I'm pretty confident in my ability to be a therapist now, but there are challenges. Mm -hmm. In the book, the voices that come up, there's 13 of them. One of them is escapist, which is, I just want to get the hell out of you. Or yeah. I want to get, maybe want to get rid of this client. I'm not equipped for it. And then the other voices come in and they're like, oh, but maybe you are. Maybe this is just a, you being critical. Or the evidence suggests that actually you are trained for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and navigating that doubt, the, th the, the anxiety that your therapist has, and I think it's a beautiful thing. A lot of therapists are very harsh on themselves, but I think it's a gift to have that inner critic. Because if yeah. you stand there like one of these therapists, and these therapists do exist, unfortunately, you know, I have completed all my training. I know everything inside out. My word is gospel. I, I worked out what the problem was with this person within 10 minutes. Yeah. You don't want to talk to that person. Mm -mm. What, what a closed-minded moron. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. So, and there's a judgmental voice from a therapist. Too. No, I think that, that but I think know. that's informed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it celebrates the vulnerability. You want a therapist who's not got everything worked out. Absolutely. Mm. I do anyway. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I'm wondering how often have you had to work through your own shit? 
in the room with a client, meaning I'll give you a personal example. The very first time I ever experienced derealization for myself was with a client and I was sitting across from them. They were just talking and all of a sudden I had this shift like everything wasn't real. Their head looked enormous and their body looked tiny like they were this tiny little bobbly head thing on the couch and I knew what was happening. Thankfully, I knew what it was like to have, I knew what it was. Otherwise, I pro- probably would have panicked, but I had to spend the rest of the session being as uh, level and mindful as I could as I watched their head just bubble around in this disproportionate way. Um, I got through it. I, f- I can say confidently, like, I think I pulled it off really well, but it was hard. And I left the session being like, what the heck just happened? Like, has there been any experiences for you like that? Uh, Yeah, all the time. I mean, first of all, I'd question if you did have derealization. I was your client with a giant head and tiny body. I was like, what's going on here? (laughs) There wasn't derealization. That's my body, Kim. That's Um, just how I look, Kimberly. (laughs) That's just how I look. Uh, Stop um, judging. (laughs) But in general, um, no, it's true. And again, one of the voices in my book, and how does that make you feel? um, It's called Trigger. Because Mm. therapists, because they have to give a lot of themselves and they're living a life and have had stuff in their past, one of the voices is Trigger. One of the things I get asked a lot, I don't know about you, Kim, but is if you've had anxiety, how can you work with it all day? I'm like, because I'm all right with it. It's okay Mm -hmm. now. Sometimes it creeps in, though. If I'm tired, if I've not slept well, uh, there's stress in my personal life that you can't avoid. Maybe I've not eaten too well. Um, Maybe it's just ongoing things. Sometimes trigger can happen. And it can be a stress-induced trigger, or it could be a literal trigger from a traumatic event. So in the book, I explain when people bring grief and death that makes sometimes makes me feel vulnerable because of my own experiences with grief and death i tell what no spoilers but the the book throughout it one of the themes is what why i became a therapist not only because for my passion for anxiety disorders and to be self-righteous around other therapists trained in different modalities but also because uh, it's a very grief informed decision Mm. Uh, to want to help people and there's some several traumatic stories a couple well one traumatic story around grief that trigger the voice of trigger will come up so someone Mm. a client could be talking about their life like i've lost this person i'll talk about it and of all these 13 voices around the table what your therapist is thinking trigger then shouts loudest it goes Ah, trigger. There's some pain that you've not felt for a while, and I've got to navigate it. Like you navigated the derealization, the the dissociation. You've got to navigate it somehow by pulling on the other voices. Uh, And not only do therapists do this, but people do this as well sometimes, whether you've got to be professional or, you know, you don't want to turn up to your friend's birthday and just listen to trigger and anxiety and start crying all over your friend's birthday cake. You know, you might, you, you might do. It's quite funny, but I was gonna not say, funny. What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> Have you done it again? I yeah. thought you stopped that. You haven't done <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the interview at CBT school. <laughs> you know, like you need to do really hard, tricky things. Right, go to your best friend's birthday and make it all about you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those. It crops up. Um, the book's funny a lot, but it, it, it takes some really serious turns and yeah. it shows to you, you know, a lot of stuff can creep in. And, and how I deal with it as a therapist, and I'm sure you related to it as well, Kim, because of yeah. we do the same job, but you yeah. just do it in a sunnier climate. Right. Uh, what I can say, and, and this will sort of be the last thing that I point out, is you also address the awkwardness of being a therapist, seeing your clients in public and the awkwardness of that or the, you know, 
oh crap, I know this person from somewhere. Like not that I'm again, no, no trigger. I don't want to give the the fun parts of the book, but as a therapist, particularly, you know, I have to constant like as someone who does exposure therapy, we I might go across the 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 road and go, take a client to have coffee because they've got to do exposures. We very often do see people, our clients, our friends during in our work. How how much does that impact the work that you do? Yeah, um, if you ever bump into your therapist, just know that you have all the power there. The yeah. therapist is squirming inside. I, um, I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. Like, do I completely blank this person? But then I look like a dick. Do I like give a subtle nod? Well, oh, you're breaking confidentiality. They're out with loved ones. Do I? I. It's up to you. You can yeah. put your therapist out of their misery by just saying, "Hey, Kim. Hey, Josh." <laughs> and then, then I will say hi back because yeah. that shows that you're okay with that. Um, but I do. There is a very extreme, shocking version of this story, of what this incident in the book, where when I'm at my lowest, I do bump into a, a previous client um, on a night out when I'm off my face on <laughs> alcohol. Oh, if you want to find out more about that, you know, oh, the media training's really paid off. Like, yeah. <laughs> get him, get him on the. I didn't, get him on I didn't the want to give man. it all away. You just did. <laughs> yeah. No, no, not not giving any more away. So media media training woman said, entice them, then leave it. Yep. Then they're more Dangle. likely to read it. So I have listened to that media woman uh, because my previous um, tactic of just begging and screaming into a camera doesn't work. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you put, but going back exactly is going back. We are squirming. I think that is true. That it is is there is a squirm factor there when you see clients in, and I it happens quite regularly for me. But I think I've come to overcome that by really disclosing ahead of time. Like if I see you outside, you're in the person, you're in the place of power. You decide what to do, and I'll just follow your suit. It's a squirm factor, though. See, that's clever, good therapy stuff because you do it all part of the contracting and stuff yes. so like actually i told all my clients this is okay but also when you're a new therapist or sometimes you forget you're like oh no yeah you know i was once i used to run a music night in manchester as part thing i did on the side enjoy it love music i was the host uh one week i was on holiday so a friend organized half organized all the lineup of, of people to come down headline act was a band name Went along, and when I'm there, I'm having fun. I've got whiskey in my hand. I'm w- walking around, telling irreverent, horrible jokes. No one in there would guess I was a therapist because um, I'm having fun and I'm entitled to you know, a life outside the therapy room. Yeah. What I didn't know was that the headline act was a current client. Oh, no. and, I, and they just arrived dead late. They didn't know, and they walked on stage, and I looked, and, I, and it's something that they've gone on publicly to talk about. So this is why I'm saying it now. Uh, and got permission to use it because they said it publicly and, yes. on, on the radio and stuff like that. And um, and we just looked at each other. It was like, oh my god! <laughs> and I'm stood there with this. Oh, I was like, oh my god! And I've said all this bad language and cracking jokes, roasting people in the audience. My friends usually, and it's like, and yeah, I was squirming. So at this point, I did just pretend I didn't know them because so it was the best I could do. And they got me out of trouble. They they were obviously go. confident in performance mode. And they got onto Mike and was like, can you believe that guy's my therapist? <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, was like, I was like, wow. Uh, and then he said some really lovely things. And that it wasn't really awkward in therapy. If, if anything, it was quite just something we laughed about in therapy afterwards yeah. and it contributed to it. But yeah, the, the horror I felt. Yeah. Oh, I felt sick. And oh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Is there, I, I want to be respectful of time. Is there anything, of course, before you share with us all about you and where people can get a hold of you and learn about your book, it, you know, is there anything you want to say final point about what it's like to actually be an anxiety therapist? It's the best job in the world for me. It's the best job in the world. Yeah, all my friends and family go, I don't care how you can do that. I love it. 
I get to have the most human conversations with people without judgment. You mentioned before about intrusive thoughts. I've got the magic guitar in this room, and we make songs about horrible intrusive thoughts. You know, <laughs> there was one the other day about kicking babies down the stairs. You can't say that out loud. Yes, we do in here to the yeah. three chords of the guitar I only know. And it's like, you know, t- particularly if post You told me mothers. we couldn't <laughs> sing today. No, I I'm not singing. <laughs> I wanted to sing today, and now you're telling me we can't sing. I don't think it's going to be Christmas number one, uh, a three chord <laughs> banger about harming loved ones or sexual intrusive thoughts, but you never know. We can all. <laughs> I am yeah, known to sing job. intrusive <laughs> thoughts to happy birthday songs. That's a good one. Yeah. I have to close my window, though, in my office because I do get scared that people walk past and like, wow, that's a very disturbed man. No, he's not. I'm confident in the powers of ERP and how it can help. (laughs) I love it. Josh, tell us where we can hear more about your book and learn more about you. So I'm Joshua Fletcher, also known as Anxiety Josh uh, on social media and stuff. The book is called And How Does That Make You Feel? Everything You Ever Slash Never wanted to know about therapy, follows the stories, uh, four client case studies, obviously highly scrambled and anonymized, uh, and gone through a rigorous ethical process there. So don't be like, he's talking about his clients. No, that's not what the book's about. It's about peering in behind the therapy room door. Um, It's out in the US before the UK, um, which is here. I don't know if anyone's watching or whatever, but there it is. and it's also been commissioned to be a television show for major streaming services. We don't know which one yet, but it's exciting. Go get yourself a copy. Um, it should be in your bookstore. You get it by Barnes & Noble and all the other US ones. And I think you really enjoy it. Um, so it's some really lovely endorsements. Kim has also said it's really good. And Kim yeah. is harsh. So if Kim says it's good, then it's going to be good. Um, and I hope you really enjoy it and pass it to a loved one who doesn't have anxiety and you'll find that, oh, I actually learned quite a lot there whilst laughing and being captivated by the absolute bananas behind the scenes life of being a therapist. Yeah, I love it. And I think, Josh, the way that you present it, I think if I was scared to go to therapy, I think it would make me less scared. I think it would make me feel like this is something I could do. And that's the best compliment I can receive because that's why I wrote the book. So thank you so much. Yeah. So fun to have you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Kim.